and I'm uh, sorry that I wasn't able to be with you personally. I'll try to make out for it one day, and I haven't seen John for many years, so I'm really happy to participate in his um, 70th birthday. I'm going to talk about a work that Joe has done in uh, 1998, I believe, quite uh, 25 years ago, and uh, I included it in my book, but I haven't given it enough uh, um, prominence that it deserves. So today I would like to talk about the um, significance of this work. So my outline will be simply be uh, to give you some background on causal reasoning and ladder of causation and what we mean by causal models and counterfactuals, and then talk about the Halperin axiom, axiomization, axiomatization of counterfactual and its significance, why it matters. And in the area of why it matters, I'll talk, uh, uh, I'll show specifically about the impact between two dialects of uh, causal uh, inference. One is a Neyman Rubin framework and the other one is a structural framework that have been competing on the attention of researchers in this area. And the impact and the significance of Joe's axiomization has been to show the logical equivalence of the two, which means that the argument about who is right um, is a futile argument. Uh, a theorem in one semantics is a theorem in another. And however, a logical equivalent is not equal to methodological equivalent. And I'll show the superiority of one dialect against other. So let's start with the ladder of causation. Here we a summary of most of the work it tells you that you have, if you do, um, <clears throat> if you formalize the um, answers to question, to causal questions, you find out that they form a hierarchy in the sense that questions of level I cannot be answered with the, unless you have assumptions in level I or higher. If, uh, specifically, if you seek uh, um, answers to questions of type of I mean, interventional type, what will happen if I do something? You cannot get it from the level uh, one, which is purely association, statistics, machine learning, and so forth. Going higher, if you're seeking answers to retrospective questions or imagining or uh, hypothetical, what um, if the asp was it the aspirin that stopped my headache? You cannot answer this question unless you have um, assumptions at this level or higher, but there's no higher, therefore, the, unless you have assumptions of that type. So this is the basic uh, perspective, uh, I'd say panoramic view of what we have today in uh, causal reasoning. It all comes from uh, defining the semantics of those questions. What is the semantic of causal like questions? Um, structural causal models gives you such semantics, semantics, and all it is is a collection of functions. That may sound some uh, complex, but it's actually very simple. All it is is collection of function of that nature. You see, y is equal to a function of x and some noise. And this function is not a regression function and it doesn't have to be linear. It's any type of function. So collection of functions like that, you find that some variables are dependent on other variables. We call them V. Other variables are not dependent on others. We call them U, background variable. And you have a collection of functions. And then, if you are, if you want to play the probability game, you can put probabilities over the um, background variables, and then you finish. This is the nature of the model, 
which you never have, but you always have in your mind as the instrument, the basis for defining semantic of question. Okay, here's an example. Um, if you find, get up in the morning, you see the pavement is wet, and you ask all kind of questions. Was it rain? Was it a sprinkler? What is the climate? What is the season? Okay. <clears throat> and we describe it as collection of functions behind the scene that connect each variable here to other variables. Here we see that the uh, rain is defined only by climate. It's not, uh, rain is an argument of the function, uh, excuse me, C is the argument in the function that defines the status of rain. And similarly, wetness is the argument of the function that defined the status, uh, defined the state of variable wetness. And you see that climate does not enter as an argument in that function. And therefore, we do not, when we plot the graph, we do not include C as a parent of W. So for every collection of function, you simply, you can easily draw the graph that defines who is an argument of whom. That's the causal graph. Good. This is the semantics of defining counterfactual. How we define counterfactual on this kind of object in the following way. Yeah. Here's a definition of counterfactual which is extremely embarrassingly simple. All it is is telling if you want to find what the value of y would be had variable x attain the value small x, all you have to do is to find out what the actual value of y is, but in a different model, a model in which you mutil mutilate. You take the model m and you cut off the function that define x, you replace by constant small x. This is a predicate the, um, in the um, counterfactual. Had x been small x, had this season been summer. Okay. So now we have a definition of counterfactual, which is very simple. It's just a solution of the equations in a mutilated model. Done. What can we say about it? Well, it has some properties. <clears throat> First, we can find easily define joint probability of counterfactual. And that's something which is miraculous, which because uh, um, many, many people, good scientists, good statisticians claim that counterfactuals are for the birds. You cannot define it because you cannot find joint probability on things which are conflicting. Why would it tend the value smaller had x been small x and simultaneously z would attain the value small z had w been small w? What if they conflict? No problem. The model tells you, yes, I can find the value of this probability. All I have to find to sum the weight on all these uh, noise factors, <clears throat> when the result uh, satisfy the condition here put in the argument of the probability. So if you're looking for that condition, some of the manipulation will yield you a, a result that conforms with the requirement here. Some will not, you rule, you rule out the worlds which do not satisfy this equation, some of the weight of those that they do, that is a probability for this joint probability. I'll show example. For instance, the easy one is intervening. What's the value of y if I take aspirin? If I do x, just sum all the <clears throat> u variables on those words, worlds which satisfy the requirement that the counterfactual of y had x be small x equal to y. This is the requirement, probability of small y. More uh, surprising result is 
that if I want for instance the probability that a patient would be alive had he not taken the drug, given that he actually found a dead and we know that he took the drug, that is not such a mysterious, mysterious entity which can compute it, but simply doing the same operation here. I think my slide is a little low. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Just yes. the, oh, okay. the bottom. I raised it. Seven. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We are simply <clears throat> summing up all the weight for all the world that satisfy this requirement. I want world such <laughs> as, <clears throat> in reality, x equal to small x, y is equal to small y. But after my, I manipulate things, I turn out the solution for y is y prime different and the solution under the manipulation of x being x prime, not x. So that's a counterfactual. It's extremely e easy and simple operation. We have an algorithm for that of computing it in three steps. But uh, here I demonstrated in, with our wetness and our pavement. So if you want to find the, uh, the uh, answer to the question, would the payment be wet had the sprinkler been on? All you have to do is cut off the line between the equation between the climate and the sprinkler, <clears throat> substitute the value sprinkler is on, S is equal to one here, solve for the equation and find out what the status of W is. Likewise, I'll go quickly. What about if you ask a question that cannot be manipulated in reality? For instance, had the rain been on, even in summer times, we don't have the physical means of manipulating rain, but we can still compute this counterfactual from the model simply by doing the same to rain. Here, I cut off the function between rain and what previously controlled rain, the climate. And I imagine that I substitute the uh, constant for rain, status equal to one, and I solve for the equation, very easy. And of course, I can do all kinds of uh, counterfactual. What if had the rain been on, the sprinkler been off? What if I know that the pavement is wet? <clears throat> what can I say about the rain had the climate been different and all kinds of manipulation. You can see that with hypothetical instrument, I can create crazy worlds. And so the counterfactual the space of counterfactual expression is extremely large, but they all can be computed for every counterfactual sentence. No matter how complex, I can assign a value in M and I can assign the probability once I assign probability to the U factors, which are not shown here. These are the known, the unobserved noise terms in each of the functions, U sub C, U sub S, and all this. I call it as U, okay? So this is the background. And now we come and ask the question, what, how can we axiomatize it? <clears throat> and Joe in 1998, came out with three um, properties which were sufficient. I emphasize the sufficiency. One is composition and it goes like that. Forget about W here, it can't cancel out. So just look at X. If <clears throat> I have observed that variable capital X equal to small X, then what I would be, what the value of Y had X been, what I observe is exactly what Y is observed. It, uh, if I translate it to uh, experimental work, if a patient died when he took a drug on, on its own volition, then he would die as well if he took the drug under, if you force him to take the drug. Okay. That is what, what it means. It's called consistency. If you remove the W, which is the constant throughout, it has been used by many people, treated as an assumption, and here we see it comes as a theorem, as a property of the semantics. 
Okay, there is another property. Effectively, which is simply, it's technical. It says if you force a variable to value X, then it attains that value. It's just a technical one to enable the proof to go through. And there's a third property which Joe discovered and which is um, important only when you have feedback systems. And this, I wouldn't elaborate so that. It simply said that you don't have any memory, that you have a unique solution for X and Y if you, if you uh, start with a certain U. For every U, you have a unique value for X or Y. So that you don't have a positive feedback and uh, all kinds of strange phenomena um, under feedback system. Okay, now what can we do with this value, with these properties? and why it is important. This is what Joe has instructed us in 1998, I believe. Joe proves that when you have a recursive system, namely no feedback, then composition effectiveness uh, are complete, sound and complete. They are, since they are properties of every the um, causal model, uh, soundness is automatic, uh, can be easily proven, but completeness is not easily proven. And you prove that they are complete, complete. Namely, you haven't forgotten any. And in, in the feedback system, composition, effectiveness, and reversibility are complete for all causal models. That you haven't forgotten any of the property means that you don't have any idiosyncratic um, effect or properties out of the fact that you are defining counterfactual using the causal graph semantics instead of some other means of defining counterfactual. And you know that people have been defined counterfactual in many ways. For instance, Lewis defined it in terms of possible worlds, then you get different kind of properties. Okay, so <clears throat> what uh, uh, Joe proved it is it, it these two properties, completeness and uh, composition and effectiveness, are sufficient for to describe all properties of uh, the uh, semantics. Uh, you haven't forgotten any. Uh, okay, why is, why is it important? It's important because today, if you look at the practice of causal inference, you find that there are two dialects. Here they are. <clears throat> one is a Neiman-Rubin model. The other one is a structural model that I described to you right now. If I would be asked to, to count I would say that 80% of the people working in causal inference are now using the Neiman-Rubin model. I'll describe it to you in a second. And only 20% are using the structural models which I describe right now. Why? Tradition. As my friend uh, <laughs> uh, Topol said in the movie, uh, Fiddler on the roof. Tradition, well, <clears throat> I'll describe to you, Neiman Rubin model was uh, came into being in 1974, actually in 1923, uh, Neiman uh, published his master thesis and he had the notation and some of the semantics for this model, Rubin popularized it and extended it in 74. And the characteristic of this model, and this is how most people are thinking in this uh, dialect, or this, I call it camp, or I call it school sometime, it goes like that. <clears throat> we have variables that we observe. We have variables which are counterfactual and their probability. And they are extremely rich world, so rich, um, space of possible counterfactuals. But 
we must connect them. There is a certain connection between the observable and the hypotheticals. What is a connection? Well, we have seen in the structural model, the connection was very clear. They're all emerging from the same structural model. Here things are different. You have to have assumptions to connect them. And the assumptions are <clears throat> called sutva. I forgot already the, what it stands for, but essentially it said, assume composition, exactly what we saw there. So we, you imagine a super distribution, the, all the, the observed variables, X and Y and Z, and all possible counterfactual sentences are sitting there and you have super probability over their combination. And this probability is constrained by the assumption of composition. This is the neiman rubin model. And what do you do with it? How do you get any, anything, any answer to the question? You go here, you express the target quantity, the research question that you have in terms of a counterfactual formula. You formulate <clears throat> the, your assumption that you have about the world using composition and the super distribution here that we have seen here. And then you algebraically determine, if you can, if Q is identifiable. Identifiable means if it has an answer, unique answer. If it does, then you estimate it using statistical technique. And if not, you just come out with a, a impossible answer. Good. Now, <clears throat> let's compare it. Let's compare these two dialects, one against the other in a specific problem and see what their uh, implications are for in terms of uh, methodological convenience. Here I'll take a simple problem. The problem that you, <clears throat> that you that a researcher imagines uh, try to find out the relation between smoking and cancer. X is smoking, cancer is Y. Those who re read the book of Y know that as the front door formula but I just described the story, just the story. So you have a picture of the world in which smoking caused cancer and you're trying to find, to quantify the, the effect. <clears throat> you know that smoking caused cancer only through the accumulation of tars in the, in the uh, lungs. And you also know that you have a confounder, a genotype, which uh, makes people crave for nicotine at the same time put them into cancer risk. Here I describe to you the perception, a qualitative perception that an epidemiologist might have when he faces this question. I describe it to you in English. You understood, understood what I described. You can communicate it to your friend. You can argue with a friend whether the model is correct, whether it is, um, I made, I didn't make any, undefensible uh, assumptions by saying that smoking affects a cancer only through the accumulation of tau and not through the other path. You can argue all this qualitatively when you are in the English language mode. But when you want to really quantify things and connect them with data, we cannot stay in English in the verbal domain. We must formulate it quantitatively. How do you formulate it quantitatively? Let's first start in the Rubin, in the Neiman Rubin model. I'll show you what these people are doing. It's not me, but uh, so I apologize for the complexity of how this thing looks. This is how you have to formulate the story, the English story that I gave you. You see a collection of counterfactuals, each one of them convey some of the assumptions in the story. For instance, I'll give you here, uh, that tells you that, um, uh, cancer is not affected by um, smoking directly. It only is affected by the accumulation of tar. So you see the effect of X 
<clears throat> is not felt once you know the value of the tar. Okay, so each one of the function assumption is formulated in terms of a sentence in counterfactual notation. And then you have from this, you have to derive an answer to the question, what if I have information? Uh, what if I have a probability on the observables, X, Y, and Z, and I'm trying to find what the uh, degree of effect can, uh, smoking has on cancer. This is, the, this is how the camp called a potential outcome operates. You agree with me that it is not too friendly, but what do I mean by friendly? For us computer science, the word friendly must be formulated. What by that may mean, what it looks so hard for a person to, to work in that domain is, it's very hard to find if these assumptions are consistent. Perhaps one of them contradicts the other. Are they complete in the sense that have we exhausted everything we know about the story that I described here? Or perhaps we forgot some assumptions. Are they redundant? That is one of them implies the other. All this is arguably, by the way, is another one which I forgot to put here. Are they testable? Do they have a testable implication? So that I may have been, if the data conflicts, data is in compatible with the model, I should rule out the model. All of these are very hard, for, and this have to be done by a human being, not by a machine. We don't have a calculus that will take it and answer this question, because it's a human being, the expert, that has to <clears throat> defend those assumptions before the analysis commences. So, these questions must be answered by a human expert before we start the analysis. Therefore, once I, I insist on friendliness, okay. <clears throat> I even have another one. Two, three minutes. Uh, yeah. How many? Two, two, three. How many minutes? Two, three, three, three. Three, good, that's perfect. That's all I need. This is another formulation of this same problem. This graph conveys exactly the same assumption that you see here. Trust me, I've gone through that many times. For every set of assumptions in the graph, there is a set of assumptions in the Neiman Rubin model, and that's how it looks for this particular one. The impact and the significance of hyperin optimization is the following, that the two are equivalent and that, here, let's go here, the SCM and the PO framework are logically equivalent in the sense that a theorem in one is a theorem in the other, which also means that starting with the same assumption, an SCM researcher will never disagree with the potential outcome enthusiast. So, and, but, and that's important. The logical equivalent doesn't imply methodological equivalent, which to us means that, oops, sorry, it means that friendly models can be as expressive and as safe as unfriendly ones. By safe, I mean, that they do, they do not generate any idiosyncratic properties that the unfriendly uh, models have uh, excluded, would not um, generate. I am about finished, uh, except for one commercial. Uh, all this is discussed in the book of why, not really, uh, but uh, not, the background is discussed in the book of why, so I highly recommend that you take a look. And since many of you are speaking Hebrew, I want to report that I just finished uh, looking at the translation of the Book of Y to Hebrew. It will be out in Tel Aviv in um, September this year. 
so you can read uh, some of the uh, biblical stories in the original biblical language. And here we are. I have completed my talk and be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. So let's take uh, any questions. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you talk about tradition, but it seems to me is that if the methodological advantage is so strong, why is it not catching up? I'll answer you the way Topol answered it. Tradition. You underestimate the uh, uh, the, the sluggishness, the power of tradition, the power of orthodoxy, and especially the power of language. When you get hooked to a language and to notation, you go to war. Even uh, Thomas Kuhn complained about it. Science progresses from one funeral to another. <laughs> you get hooked to notation and your PhD students get hooked to them and they need your recommendation and they, because they need tenure too and uh, science gets stuck on notation. Okay, so let's thank you again.